So it is 1 p.m. I want to be a good steward of your time. Welcome to today's webinar. I have been fired up about this topic for quite some time. If, if you have been around me in the past few weeks, you know I've talked a lot about this. But we are so grateful that you've taken the time to invest in yourself as a parent. I know we have some coaches on here, some directors on here. Uh, as long as you're a human, I think you will find this beneficial, even if you have your dog with you sitting in your lap listening. Uh, they may find it beneficial as well. But I mean, it's crazy time of life we're living in. Uh, but I think this is an important topic that we can cover as parents. Uh, man, it's our passion to help families on this athletic journey. So I hope today will be a benefit to you. My name's Heath Esslinger. I am married. Uh, my wife's name is Brandy. We have four children. I have a 15 year old daughter who's a sophomore in high school playing club volleyball right now. I have twin 13 year old daughters. That's right, I'm raising three teenage girls right now. They're actually home for virtual school. So if you hear a teenage fight uh, break out here in just a moment, don't be alarmed. It's just my girls up there trying to figure out school. And we also have a nine year old son. And so, man, my life is a Petri dish for the things that we talk about. We are not experts. We simply have experience that we wanna share with you to help you as you navigate the sport journey. I spent the last 20 years of my life in the coaching profession. Uh, man, I got to be a division one athlete somehow, some way. Uh, I got into coaching. I spent several years as a high school coach, landed a division one coaching job uh, uh, about a decade ago, spent 10 years in division one coaching and then resigned with this passion to help families and coaches as they navigate the sport journey. And we will be recording these sessions. If you have to leave early, we're going to send this to you as a recording. If you have questions as I go about today, put those questions in the chat room, and we would love to answer those uh, at the end of the day. But a few years ago, when I resigned at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, my sports supervisor asked me, he said, Heath, why are you so passionate about what you're going to do? And I said, Jay, because I got two head coaching jobs, and both times they told me good luck. And he was one of the guys that hired me. And I said, as a parent, I can remember loading my daughter Brooklyn up in the car as an infant and putting her in that car seat. They send this nurse out with you and it's like, you know, you're, you're pulling out and you're like, how am I going to keep this person alive? And it's like, there's no manual, there's no operating instructions. It's just like, you just have to figure it out. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is, is helping families go on this athletic journey and do it well, to do it well, to actually cultivate the things uh, that are necessary. So I'm going to share my screen with you and we're going to dive in here quickly. We'll be about 40 minutes and then we'll leave it uh, for some question uh, and answers here in, in just a moment. But again, I hope you find today beneficial. If you have questions, uh, feel free, put them in the chat room. But why is my kid not playing? How do I manage these unmet expectations? I've spent the last two weekends at volleyball tournaments around uh, the Southeast and here's what I know. There's 50% of the parents that are happy and there's 50% of the parents that are frustrated. There's half the girls that are excited because they're on the court and then there's half the girls that are frustrated and simply asking questions, why am I not on the court? So who are we? What is a better way athletics? I want to share briefly just our history. Again, about 10 years ago, I, I had this just compelling uh, vision to say we have to help parents on the athletic journey. Here's what my coaching friends say. If you're a parent out there, don't take this personal because I'm a parent too, so they're saying it about me. My coaching friends would say, the parents, they're all crazy. Well, here's what we believe at A Better Way Athletics. I don't think I'm crazy. I just simply think I love my kid. And oftentimes what it is for a parent is what we call a misapplication of love. And so at A Better Way Athletics, we're committed to helping create alignment between parents and coaches so the athlete can receive the benefits that the sport journey can actually offer. So what's our purpose? We believe sports an arena for growth. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we planting and what are we cultivating? Because sport can also produce some really negative things if we let it. What's our mission? Our mission is to do this, to provide, to provide a playbook for a positive sport experience. Man, sport is a gift. It's meant to be fun. Are there moments of misery? Yes, I was division one wrestler. I've done things that will make a billy goat puke. I've put myself through some very difficult things but the experience was meant to be fun. And so how do we provide a playbook to parents and coaches to create a positive sport experience? And then our vision was this, to restore the joy of sport for parents, coaches, and athletes. And, and that's really where it started for us, is how do we step in 
to a family's life? How do we step into an organization and help them create this environment where there's a positive experience and people are actually experiencing joy as we go on this journey? As I began the sport journey with my own children and I sat in the stands with all these other moms and dads, here's what I realized. Most people are miserable. I mean, it's a nine-year-old soccer match and no one's having fun because we're so stressed out. So hopefully today we're going to help pull the pressure release valve on that and alleviate some of the stress for you. So why is my kid not playing? You've probably asked that question. Hey, you've paid the fees, you've put in the work, you've got the lessons. Uh, you and your mind, you think your kid's pretty good. And there's a couple of obstacles. When we ask that question, there's a couple of obstacles I think as parents that we have to call a timeout, we have to pause, and we have to recognize. And there's the two obstacles I see most commonly that hinder us from uh, navigating these things in a healthy way. The first obstacle is real simple. It's called pain. Uh, no one likes to see their kid get cut. No one likes to see their kid put on the bench. No one likes to see their kid get pulled out of the game because it's painful. I mean, Again, I've been a coach. I've been a parent. Both of those jobs are super difficult. Even for me, it's not like I'm immune to these emotions. It's not fun when your child shanks one or strikes out and they get yanked out of the game, not because the coach is mean or mad at them necessarily, probably just frustrated. There's just a ton of pain involved when we watch our kids go through these hardships. But oftentimes, it's those moments of pain that produced produce the greatest result. And so the first thing we have to realize about this is that it is painful. And if we recognize it's painful, then we create a better uh, game plan on how we navigate it. The second obstacle is this, man, we live in a culture today that, be that believes and has convinced ourselves that our kids' performance is the validation for us as parents. In the comparison world we live in, we convince ourselves that the way our kid plays on the court, the way they run on the field, the way they operate in the gym is our validation as a parent. I can remember we were at a, an event last year and someone walked up to me and they said, are you not stressed out about this game? And I'm like, listen, I have zero to do with this game. Zero. If she plays great, I deserve zero credit. If she plays terrible, I deserve zero blame. So I'm going to call a timeout, take a deep breath, and I'm going to enjoy watching them play. And I'm going to look for opportunities to cultivate the right characteristics when it's over. And so as a parent, one of the things we have to grasp immediately is there are some things that hinder our perspective. Uh, if you've ever been put in a painful situation, it will hinder your perspective. If you've ever felt like, hey, this is the thing that's going to validate me, it can hinder your perspective. The next thing I want us to look at is what are some of the false realities that we deal with as a parent? And when, oh, I went too soon. And those false realities are not just true for you. They're true for me. They're true for every mom and dad across the country that are watching their kids play. But we have to understand this. As a parent, here's what we have to realize. We see this with our heart. When we are watching our kid go through these scenarios, on the athletic journey, we see these scenarios with our heart. And we see those scenarios based on our child. And when we see things with our heart, here's what we can realize. Sometimes it can be dangerous. Listen, our heart can deceive us, man. Hey, I feel like this is the right decision, but I know if I were to actually take a step back, it's probably not a good decision. We would tell our kids that, hey man, don't always base your decision on emotion or how you feel. Sometimes you base it on wisdom. And so when we see these things with our heart, sometimes it can lead to some detrimental behaviors for some really great people. Uh, again, coaches will tell me, hey, they're crazy. I'm like, they're not crazy. I saw them at Publix last night and they were super cool. But when their son struck out in the second inning of the game, they lost it. And it's simply because they're feeling it so heavy with their heart. And a coach sees things with his mind. He's trying to make a decision based on the sum of the whole and a great coach, I would say, would see things with his heart and mind, or she would see things with her heart and mind. And so here's some of the false realities we face as parents. Well, we're competitive, so it hurts. Just last week, I was talking to a mom, and she said, Heath, but like, it's so hard because our family's just so competitive. So when she sits on the bench, 
it's just really painful to me. And I said, let's pause here for a moment. If we were truly competitive, we would want our kid on the most difficult team having to fight the biggest battles in order to get in the game. Here's what I've realized about me that may not be true of you. Most of the time, it's not an issue of competitiveness. It's an issue of selfishness. And the thing that I want you to know, and I want you to liberate you with today is this, that selfishness resides in all of us. And it's not necessarily bad. We just have to put it in its proper place. Because if it begins to lead us and guide us, then it can become dangerous. And so, man, what is one of those false realities? Well, we're just competitive. So that's why it hurts so bad. No, many times it's just because we're selfish. Here's the second thing. And I hear parents said it, and I've said it in my heart probably. Well, they're just as good as the other player. Man, one of the things that I've realized over the past two years is the sports world is a game of inches. And if it's a game of inches, here's what we leave uh, for the coach to do. It's a coin toss. And if it lands on heads, it's in our favor. So we're super happy as a family. If it lands on tails, well, then they go with the other player and that family is super happy. But if it's simply a game of inches, listen, it really like it, it's a coin toss on who gets the starting job or who plays the most or, you know, who gets up to bat or who, who makes that throw. It's a coin toss. And so I can remember this year, my daughter was put in a situation. Again, I'm a Petri dish for these realities. And, and I told her, I said, I said, you know, you have to realize this is a game of inches. And so I'm not going to justify or argue or blame your coach for anything. This is my suggestion. If it's a game of inches, you need to put in the work to get a mile ahead. Like if you really want the job and you really want the position, then the best advice I can give you is if it's a coin toss, it could go either way. But if you get a mile ahead, if you will put in the work to get so far ahead, I think it'll be really hard for your coach not to believe you're the best, you're the best person for that position at that particular time. And so, so many times it's easy for us to blame versus give our, ch give our children a challenge and let them step up to the plate. That's how we breed confidence. Here's the third thing. Well, I just want them to have a chance to grow as a person. Well, if that was true, then the, most, the more difficult the obstacle, usually the more growth that takes place. And so really, is it that we want them to grow as a person or do we want them to just have an opportunity as a player? And I'm going to pause here for a moment because here's what I want to challenge every parent that's on the call with today. Here's where I want to challenge you. I do believe deep down we want our children to grow up to be great people, but I think we lose focus. And so one of the challenges I would have for you today is this. When we end this session or sometime this afternoon or sometime in the next few days, take out a sheet of paper, just a white sheet of paper and simply write down the five qualities that you want your child to possess when they leave your home. And once you identify those five qualities in every difficult situation you find yourself in, ask how you can cultivate those qualities through that list. Like what, what can I do in this situation that's painful, that doesn't seem right, but what, are, what can I do to help cultivate those qualities? If we will begin to see it through that lens, then we begin to produce things in our children that I'm telling you, it's like a head start that no one else has. And so the fourth thing is this, you can't get better if, you're, if you aren't playing in games. Man, that, that's a total, I call that a misconception, a sport misconception. Playing in games is fun. Winning games is even more fun. But you get better through this avenue that we call preparation and practice. One of the things we're even seeing the research reveal today, because we have kids playing so many games so early, we're not teaching them how to prepare and practice. Well, at some point you get in a room where preparation is really important because everyone else is equally as good. And so one of the things we have to continue to reiterate both to ourselves and to our children is that, hey, the place you're going to see the greatest gains is in the practice facility. It's on that field five days a week. The, the ratio in reps from practice to games is crazy. And so when someone says, hey, man, you know, they, they have to be getting reps in the game in order to be getting better. Well, listen, reps in a game are more fun, but it's the reps in practice that really multiply themselves and move and catapult us forward. And so these false realities are things we simply have to look in the mirror and say, you know what? It's true of me. 
All right, as a guy who writes a ton of this curriculum, again, I'm not immune to this. Here's what I believe. When we put it in its proper perspective, it helps liberate us to lead our children in a way that's healthy and productive so that they can get to the place that we know they're capable of being. And so if those are the false realities, what does it create in our children when we don't yield to these things? When, when we just kind of go with the flow and we play the blame game and we're, we're negative and all these things, what does it produce? I'm going to play a little video here for you that I think you'll find quite humorous. I hope you do. How did your game go last night? We won. But I didn't even get in the game. That's okay. You are only a sophomore and you are playing on varsity. So what? My coach sucks. Your coach has been coaching for 15 years, has won three state championships, and five conference titles. Your team is 17 and 3 this season. So what? My coach sucks. How can you say that? Because my dad, my girlfriend, and my AAU coach all tell me how good I am and that I should play more. I'm telling you, my coach sucks. They just say that because they love you. They don't know basketball. My coach sucks. Have you talked with your coach and asked what you can do to earn more playing time? No, my coach sucks. Do you come in before practice to work on your game? No, my coach sucks. Do you practice as hard as you can all of the time? No, my coach sucks. Did you work hard during the off season? Did you lift weights? Run sprints? Work on your ball handling and shooting? No, my coach sucks. You need to stop blaming your coach and hold yourself accountable. But my coach sucks. If you want to be the best player you can be, then your coach is the only person you should listen to. You suck. <laughs> and so I have, uh, I have played that video for hundreds and thousands of people, and it gets a laugh. If you're a coach on the call, I'm sure you're going to send me an email and say, hey, will you send me the link to that video? But if, if you are a parent or coach on here, here's what you know. You identify with that. Listen, I hear that all the time. I see that all the time. And here's what I want you to know. Most parents and people are not creating that type of attitude intentionally. But if we don't have a game plan to fight against it, that will be the attitude. If we, if we portray that and we communicate that even through body language, not even by speaking, I mean, if we're always rolling our eyes or we're always making excuses, what will happen is, is our, our kids will begin to take on uh, that, that sort of behavior and that sort of attitude. And so many times it's not intentional. In there, he said, hey, my dad, my girlfriend, and my AU coach all tell me how great I am. Here's what that translated means. My coach sucks if he isn't playing me. Hey, my coach isn't any good if he's not playing me because, listen, my parents told me uh, I'm as good as the other player. All of those things we just addressed, that's what the kid will begin to say. And the only person we hurt, when those attitudes are present is the person we love the most, and that's our child. And so obviously you're on this call or you're on this webinar today because you want to do better. One of my great friends and mentors, Mark Cole, challenged me with this several years ago. And he said, Heath, you can't be a tour guide to a land you've never visited yourself. You can't be a tour guide to a land you've never visited yourself. Each and every week, almost every day, I will have parents or coaches call me and say, what can I do to help my athletes? And here's where I want to pause for a moment and challenge each of us today. The, the initial question doesn't need to be, how can I help my son or daughter? It needs to be, how can I challenge myself? Because I can't help them get to a place that I'm unwilling to visit myself and my heart and my mind. And so if I want to see an attitude shift in them, then that attitude shift first has to begin in me. And so hopefully you're going to see some things today that, that are going to help you do that. And so, hey, how do we manage your emotions in this season of uncertainty when our kids aren't not playing, man? We're sitting there. We're on the sidelines. We're fuming. I mean, I watch it. We're asking questions. We're watching our son or daughter. We're seeing how they react. We're seeing if they look at us for validation. And so the first thing that I think can help us as we, as we kind of go on this journey to doing better, and the reason we're called a better way athletics is because we're not the best way, all right? We're not the only way, but we do believe this. As a parent, coach, or athlete, every single day, I can get better. There's a great documentary called In Search of Greatness, and they look at what does it take to be an elite level athlete? What does it take to be elite at something in life? And the first thing is this, it's a rage to master. And so 
listen, we're not perfect by any stretch, but we want to move toward mastery when it comes to parenting, when it comes to coaching, when it comes to being an athlete, we want to get better. And so what's the first way we can help manage our emotions in this season of certainty? The first thing is this, don't deny the reality of the, the, the disappointment. Don't deny the reality of the disappointment. Just put it in its proper place. The fact that it's real, you can see on the bottom of the screen here, the fact that it's real doesn't mean it has to rule. Many times I will hear coaches say, well, they just need to get over it or they don't need to worry about it. Listen, you are a mom or a dad of a person who you've, you've invested tons of time, money, energy, and effort into. It matters. And I'm giving you permission for it to matter. Here's what I'm asking. Don't let the, the disappointing mo moments rule in your child's athletic journey. Our disappointment doesn't need to become our child's distraction or excuse. Let me say that again. Our disappointment, because our kids are experiencing the same disappointment. They don't want to be on the bench either. They don't want to be sitting on the sidelines either. But we cannot allow our disappointment to become our child's distraction or excuse. I often say to parents, you can take something that's uh, in and of itself insignificant and talk about it so much that it becomes significant. Hey, you got pulled out of the game. We're going to talk about it the whole two hour car ride home. And all of a sudden something that was insignificant in reality, it hurt, but it was insignificant in the big scheme of things. All of a sudden we have, we have bubbled that thing into something that's completely significant. So if you aren't disappointed when your kids don't play, you're probably not human. Okay. I can get disappointed when my kids don't play. That's part of it. But here's what I do. I put that disappointment in its proper place and I don't let it rule in my life. And so here's what we know when disappointment and negativity rule. It pushes our kids away from sport. It doesn't draw them in. When disappointment and negativity rule, if that's the common language spoken in any of these circumstances, then what happens is we don't draw our kid into getting better. We actually push our kid away from an opportunity. Again, how does our kid see this? They see it in our body language. They hear it in our verbal language. And sometimes here's what I have to do as a parent. I simply have to be quiet. Listen, when, I, when we get in the car, uh, when we're sitting on the sidelines, when we're eating out that night, here's what I simply need to do. I simply need to be quiet and not talk about the situation. Me fixing it doesn't usually do a whole, me trying to fix it, I usually never fix it, but me trying to fix it usually doesn't do a whole, lot of, a whole lot of good. So the first thing is, don't deny the reality of the disappointment, just put it in its proper place. If you need to take a little walk around the gym one day, take a walk around the gym, gather your thoughts and come back. Here's the second thing when it comes to managing these emotions. Man, this is huge. Choose to respond rather than react. Choose to respond rather than react. We as parents have to predetermine our responses. Here's what I've discovered. Listening is always better than lecturing and affirming is always better than accusing. Pick something out your daughter did well. I don't care if it's she, she chased balls while she was on the bench. Find an intrinsic quality that you can affirm rather than accuse someone for why the opportunity is not there. It will never lead to great outcomes when our emotions dictate our reactions. We have to have a formulated response. And you say, well, I don't know all the outcomes. Well, here, I'm going to give you the outcomes that are possible in any sort of game, any sort of sport, any sort of age, any sort of time. Your kid plays the whole game and they're the MVP. Formulate your response. Because if you don't formulate your response, you will create entitlement and arrogance in your child. And so don't make too much of that moment. Affirm it, but don't make too much of it because the journey will continue, all right? The same people you pass on the way up the ladder, you pass on the way down the ladder. Second scenario, your, your child plays a little bit, all right? That's where most of us fall. Our kids play some, all right? What's my response gonna be? How am I gonna predetermine my response in that scenario? And then the third response is the one we're talking about today. And it's, hey man, my kid's been putting in the work, but they don't play. Here's what we know about responses. Andy Stanley, he's a leadership guru, wrote a book called uh, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. 
And in this book, here's what he says, a response creates a better path forward than a reaction. And then he says a reaction, it's on your screen here, a reaction makes a bad situation worse. A response usually creates a bridge that makes things better. A reaction makes a bad situation worse. A response usually creates a bridge that makes things better. And so if you were to put these words side by side, here's what, here's what react does. React relinquishes control of the story. When we react and we blow our fuse and we start saying things that aren't productive, here's what we ultimately, ultimately do. We relinquish control of the story and we want the story to end well. On this athletic journey, we want the story to end well. When we respond, here's what I love the wording he uses in this book. He says, we redeem the pain. Remember, what's the first uh, hindrance or obstacle when our kid's on the bench? It's pain. And so when we respond versus react, here's what happens. We redeem the pain and we reverse the course. We actually give our child a chance to overcome this obstacle in this situation that they're in today. And so here's what, here's my challenge to you. Never underestimate the power of a measured response. A healthy response is always more beneficial than an emotional reaction. Let me say it again. Never underestimate the power of a measured response. Measured means we've thought it out. We know what could be coming. So we think about it just like we do when we're going somewhere, we create a route. And so that's what we have to do as parents as we navigate the sport journey, knowing at some point, at some time, on some day, our kid's going to be sitting on the sidelines. What's our measured response? Because a healthy response is always more beneficial than an emotional reaction. Here's the third thing. Understand that rescuing now can rob them of the re resiliency they will need later. Understand that rescuing them now can rob them of the resiliency that our children, those we say we love so much, are going to need later. I love what Dr. Tim Elmore said. He says, don't prepare the path for your child. Prepare the child for the path. And so it is absolutely necessary, okay? This is necessary. And life will present it. We just don't need to protect from it. It is absolutely necessary for our kids to ride the struggle bus at times. All right. I'm not one of those guys. And, and I, I argue this at, at times. I'm not the person that's out on social media saying we need to let our kids fail. Here's why. Look around our society. We have a society that's failing at an epic rate. We lack resiliency. We lack diligence. We lack consistency. We love the easy way. We have a society that's failing at an epic rate. In the Esslinger household, in a better ways model, is not that we need to teach kids how to fail. They know how to fail, all right? As soon as it gets hard, they'll, they'll bow out. The goal is not to teach our kids to fail. It's to teach them to struggle so that they know how to finish. And so in order for our children to know how to finish in those difficult moments, in order for us to know how to finish in those difficult moments, we have to be willing to let them struggle. Here's the difference in failure and struggle. The one difference in failure and struggle is the punctuation at the end of a difficult moment. The one difference in failure and struggle, someone, I, I can remember I was talking to John Gordon one day and he said, well, hey, Babe Ruth failed more than he succeeded. No, Babe Ruth didn't fail. He struck out. But when it was his, his turn again, he got right back up to bat. Failure would be I, stri I strike out and I never get back up to bat. Babe Ruth struggled, but he continued to pursue an opportunity to master the opportunity to hit that baseball. And so the difference in failure and struggle is the punctuation at the end of a difficult moment. And so they haven't played, you're frustrated, you know, you feel like it's over, your child feels like it's over. As a parent, here's what, here's what we have to do. And so in that moment, it seems like there's a period. In that moment of struggle, it seems like there's a period, which that period would make that situation a failure because we're not going to continue and press on. Here's what we have the privilege of doing as parents. You ready? We have, a, we have the privilege of either putting a line above the period and making it an exclamation mark and just making the situation worse, or we can do this. You ready? Picture this with me. We can take that period and we can put a little comma below it and we can make it what I call a semicolon. 
And here's what a semicolon is. You ready? I'm not an English major. I got a degree in, in PE, okay? But a semicolon is this. A semicolon is a punctuation mark indicating a pause. And so we're in this moment. It didn't go as planned. Our child's on the bench. It's frustrating. There's all these emotions. It feels like there's a period. And yet we formulated our response. We've been willing to let them struggle. And so what we do in that season and in those moments, we put a little comma below that period and we pause. We pause for a moment. And in that pause, a, a semicolon actually means it's typically between two main clauses. All right. So we pause event before. We know there's going to be an event after. How am I preparing my child to be ready for the next event? And our reactions and our, our responses and how we view these things and our perspective is either going to set our kid up for excellence or it's probably going to set our kid up for failure. And so as a parent, we have this great privilege to actually make that a semicolon versus an exclamation mark or a period. And so how do we do that? Two, two tips I want to give you when we talk about rescuing. And it's so hard because, again, it's that pain and it's that validation that sinks in. One, rescue less quickly. In the moments of struggle, rescue less quickly. You are probably going to need a friend or a spouse or someone to help you in this because our natural tendency is to run to their rescue. And so we have to fight against the tendency to rescue so quickly. And so the first thing is rescue less quickly. And then the second thing is just accommodate less often. One of the things I hear coaches at the upper level say all the time, well, kids today have no coping skills. Well, no kidding. We never let them cope. And so as a parent, the privilege I have is to let my kid cope with things that match their age and, and the appropriate consequence. And so I always, I always say to myself and to others, listen, a, a six-year-old struggle has a six-year-old consequence. If you let them get through it, it produces a little bit of resiliency to get them ready for the seven-year-old struggle. But if we rescue and rob them the whole time, an 18-year-old struggle has an 18-year-old consequence, and then they're not ready for it. And so as parents, we need to understand that rescuing them now can rob them of the resiliency they're going to need later. And then the last one, and we'll open it up for some questions. The fourth thing is this, man. As a mom or a dad, as a coach, as a leader, as a friend, as a neighbor, I, I don't care, as, as a human, man, we have to focus on who they're becoming, not on what they are doing or achieving. Man, focus on who they're becoming, not on what they are doing or achieving. Man, our kids feel so much pressure today because everything is validated by the scorecard or the report card or by the Instagram or the Snapchat or the TikTok, our children have enough pressure on them. Focus on who they are becoming. One of the greatest tragedies of today, and I saw it play out in all of Division I sports, all right, all of Division I sports is this, is that kids today, my kids included, have gifts and skills like we've never seen before. Listen, go to a little league game, a 12-year-old volleyball match, a 10-year-old wrestling match, a, a flag football game, or, or an 11-year-old basketball game. Man, these kids are so talented and gifted because we've invested so much in their gifts and skills. But one of the greatest tragedies I saw as a coach at the Division I level, and parents, we need to take this so serious, is that kids today have gifts and skills that have gotten them to a room that their character won't allow them to stay. Their gifts and skills, man, they're super talented, gets them to a room where at some point everyone else has equal gifts and skills. And so what's the separating factor once I get in that room? It's do I have the character to stay and to press on in that room when everyone else is just as good as me? And so one of the challenges and privileges we have as a parent is to focus on who they're becoming, not on what they're doing or achieving. Here's what I can tell you in the Esslinger household. I can't guarantee what room my daughters are going to be in. I was fortunate to be an athlete. My wife's an athlete. Our kids are having success. Success is relative. But here's what I can really focus and, 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 and hone in on is that my job, my greatest responsibility as the father of my children is to give them the character 
that whatever room they rise to the occasion and end up in, that they would have the character to stay in that room. No, no, no matter the outcome achieved, parents, no matter the outcome achieved, big or small, or opportunity given, you play a ton or you play a little or you play none, we have to focus on what matters most. We have to zoom out. We have to put these things in perspective, take a deep breath, and we have to focus on what matters most. The number one principle, the first principle we teach at A Better Way Athletics is this. Don't get so consumed with what matters now that you completely lose sight of what matters most. Man, we're, we're listen, if, if our goal is an eight-year-old baseball game, then we probably just have the wrong vision for our children. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like, listen, we want them, we want to set them up for success in the future. Man, we want them to finish their high school career. We want them to have an opportunity and the hunger to play at the highest level when that comes. And so, man, you can feel like in this comparison world that we got to keep up, we got to keep up. Here's what I would tell you. The greatest gift you can give your child that will put them ahead of everyone else, because at the end of the day, I can't make my kid a lot quicker. I can't make them very much taller. I can't make them a whole lot stronger in essence. But here's what I can do. I can give them the character that separates them from the pack so that whatever room they get to, they have the character to stay. Our job as parents isn't motivation. It's maturation. Our job as parents isn't motivation. It's maturation. Even as a coach, my job as a coach isn't just to be motivator, rah, 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 whatever. My job is to mature them into people who can walk on their own two feet make decisions for themselves, be responsible, handle the obstacles that are thrown at them, and be a productive member of this world that we're living in. So the question is this, are we using the journey in front of us to not just provide for our children, but to prepare our children for what's next? And so, man, I hope this was beneficial. Here's what I want you to know. Like sitting in my basement, like with three teenage girls upstairs and a nine-year-old son in elementary school right now, listen, I know how hard it is. Like it is super, super difficult, but man, we are committed at A Better Way Athletics. Man, we are committed to partnering with you. Man, we would, man, I challenge you, find us on social media, just search A Better Way Athletics. It's 2021. If you want to find us, you can find us. If you don't, it's not going to hurt my feelings, but we do want to partner with you and help you. We do offer online virtual training for clubs, schools, teams, and families. If you want more information on what that looks like, send me an email, Heath, at abetterwayathletics.com. Um, I would love to partner with you and see how we could help your organization. Here's Leadership is all about alignment. And if coach is pulling in one direction, and when the kid gets in the car, the parent is pulling in another direction, there's one person that suffers. And it's not the coach or the parent. It's the child. And so we've got to create some alignment as we move forward, if we want to produce the best people that can, uh, that we can produce. And we want to provide you with some ongoing education uh, and engagement. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open it up, man. That's a lot of information. I'm going to open it up uh, to the chat room and see if you guys have any questions down there. A uh, few questions over here in the question and answer. We will be recording. Will you email the presentation after this zoom? We will email the presentation. Um, Elaine, this is great. Uh, will we have access to the slide deck? Elaine or Elena, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. If you will, uh, if you will send me your email, I'll be glad to send you this slide deck uh, as well. So um, we, we wanna be a resource and a help to you. So any more questions, let's, do, let's open it up. I'm gonna be quiet as, as we navigate this whole idea of the sport journey, play in time and the disappointment that comes with it. Fire away, parents. There's got to be a question because I know there's emotion. Uh oh, we got one coming in. I will send. I will send you all that. Houston's Juniors Volleyball Club. Get in touch with us. We'd love to partner with you. Yes, we can send the slideshow out too. Is there a version of this for the student athlete? Fourteen-year-old girl, girl might need to hear this firsthand. Listen, here. We do offer some things for the athletes. Our passion is parents because we believe we dictate, provide the direction. Uh, there's more of that stuff coming uh, for the athletes. So we'll let you know as we um, uh, offer some webinars for them specifically. 
here's what I would challenge uh, those of you as parents, just have some of these conversations. Like it's, listen, my kids know it's hard for us. Uh, it's super hard. So how do you manage a child? How do you manage a child that plays a lot now, but know as she grows, she'll be with more players with better skills with less playing time? Man, James, thank you for that question. And so I call that the, the intersection of success and struggle. So our kid has played a lot. Maybe they were just a little bit ahead. They're a little bit older. They're a little bit more mature. They're a little bit more aggressive, aggressive. And so here's what we have to realize. And I love what Dr. Tim Elmore says. He says, abandonment is dangerous. Abundance is equally as dangerous. And so what we have to be doing as a parent is we always have to be balancing those things. And so there are times, there are times where we, probably should allow our kids to be on some teams where it's not the phenom team because life doesn't always allow you to pick your team. And so the earlier we can do that, the better so that they realize there is a struggle involved in getting better because there's a lot of research like around puberty where kids you see they were kind of the phenom earlier then they kind of fade back because they don't know how to deal with the struggle and they don't really know how to push through. But then you also have kids that they struggle so much early, they don't even give themselves a chance. And so here's what I would say as a parent, you're constantly balancing these scales. All right. You're constantly balancing these scales. The number one thing we do, we want to keep them hungry. The biggest issue I see today is that we feed our kids so much at 14 or 15 years old, nothing on the plate looks good. And so we have to keep our kids hungry. So I'm a big believer in taking breaks, sabbaticals, pre-14 years old. Once your child is 14 or 15, they can begin to choose, hey, I want to go hard at this thing. But at anywhere before like 14 years old, you have to build in some strategic breaks because if they're not hungry, they're not going to be coachable. They're not going to absorb learning. And so keep them hungry. Great question. A couple more coming in. Uh, be so good that they can't ignore you. I, I love that. I love this phrase here. Uh, I think it's. A, I think this is a. This is a great way to protect ourselves as parents and our children. Uh, my good friend Greg Taylor at Winning Edge. He has a son playing for the 49ers right now, who's five eight, and so kind of an overachiever. One of the things he said is that, you know, early on he would always tell his his kids like, "You got to be the best. Be the best. Be the best." Here's what I want you to know, every parent out there. Your kid can do everything possible in order to be the best and a 6-4 player can walk onto the court and just school them all right the goal is not to be the best the goal is to be our best the goal is to challenge them to be their best how do we maximize the potential that's been given to us and if we do that we'll find ourselves in some pretty uh elite level elite elite level rooms and so I feel that teaching the parents is almost more important than the athlete today thank you Kara we agree with that too our son has talked to coach after weeks coach coach indicated doing what needs uh, to but only member of team not getting tons of minutes of playing time no small recognition okay so here's one of the challenges we have for coaches because we offer coaches trainings too one of the biggest issues for us as parents and coaches is if the only scoreboard we have is playing time and performance well that's where we get our validation and so let's start with the parent, Michelle, great, great word. One of the things we have to do as parents is we have to make sure we have another scoreboard besides playing time and performance. And so we have to catch our children doing things well that we know set them up for success later in life. And so we change the scoreboard. For coaches, one of the things we wanna help coaches do, and we have a whole coaches education program, we wanna help the coach change the scoreboard too. Because there are times a kid may not get to play, but they add a ton of value to the team. One of my greatest regrets as a coach is I missed opportunities to praise behaviors that were things we valued because it just wasn't showing up in, in competition. And so as a coach, we simply just have to be mindful of that. As a parent, we have to be mindful of that. And so here's my challenge to you as parents. Catch your kids doing things that you value as a family. When you see your child be empathetic toward a player, catch them doing it and make sure they know you noticed it. Listen, getting an ace in volleyball, everybody notices that. Listen, they do the little stomp on the floor, whatever. Everybody, you know, gets excited. But when your daughter picks someone up off the floor or they walk over and console a teammate after, after a bad play or whatever, 
listen, though, we have to be very aware to catch our kids doing those things. Uh, if, if we want those things to become the behaviors of their life. And so uh, Coles and Pell, I have a very young daughter, but I'm a coach as well. When I see parents struggling with their elementary kids level of success, I usually focus on bringing positivity. Here's what I would say. We don't even need to be measuring success in elementary school. Uh, at least not when it comes to the scoreboard. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. I say it all the time. Scoreboards do not create competitive kids. You ready for this? Write this down. Scoreboards do not create competitive kids. They create overzealous, crazy adults, me included. Scoreboards don't create competitive kids. Work ethic, habits, discipline, self-control, that creates competitive kids. Scoreboards don't create, we, we have more scoreboards in the history of the world. Yet at the upper levels, coaches will say, well, kids just don't love to compete anymore. It's not that they don't love to compete. They've just learned to compete at an apathetic level, all right? A, a, a nine-year-old was not designed to play 300 games of anything a year. The Olympics are every four years, all right? That's for adults. We probably don't need to be playing as many games as we're even playing. I'm a believer in the Pareto principle, 80-20. 80 percent preparation, 20 percent competition. And so I think that's a way that we can, we can help there. And so the ability to compete and problem solve for our youth today is hard when we grew up. That's it. So here's what we have to do. If problem solving is important, rescue less quickly, accommodate less often. Let them solve the problem. The greatest gift my parents gave me was the gift of figuring it out. Figure it out. But even in the sports world today, our kids are so trained to be robots. Like, I mean, listen, you have a seven-year-old and he's getting pitching lessons. Just let him figure it out. All right. I actually think we're seeing more injuries because we're teaching kids to do things too early. All right. Every single body on the planet is different. Not every kid's mechanics are going to be exactly the same. Their body will adapt. Let them just throw. And then when they're older, probably post puberty, we're going to give them like some real like uh, like dialed in instruction. And so how do you how do you balance being a parent over being a coach with your family? I did an email or I did a podcast with Todd Rucci. He played for the Patriots a few weeks ago. Here's what Todd said. Both of his boys are playing football at the University of Wisconsin right now. He was their offensive line coach, Cole. Here's what he said. He drew a line in the sand and he never crossed it. He said, can you imagine, this is what he said to me. He, he said, Heath, I can't imagine living with my offensive line coach. Your kids do not want to live with their coach. And so even if you're not their assigned coach, don't try to be their coach at home. Don't try to be their coach at home. Just be the parent. Provide direction, provide instruction, but provide it in life, not just on the playing field and things like that. A couple of questions in the chat room. How do you work with a child that could be overly motivated? Here's what you do. Take food away. I have people tell me all the time, well, my, I'm not making my kid do it. They want to do it. Well, here's what I want you to know about my kids. They would eat Dunkin' Donuts every morning for breakfast, but I don't let them because I'm an adult and I see the negative ramifications of eating donuts every morning for breakfast. And so one of the things we have to do as parents is even though our kids want to do it, doesn't mean they should get to. And so I believe this at the younger ages, there's small seasons and we're doing multiple activities. I'm, I'm not even saying multiple sports, multiple activities, teach them how to swim, teach them how to water ski, teach them how to ride a bike, teach them how to ride a motorcycle. Uh, let them play multiple sports. But if we want our children to have physical literacy, we have to let them do multiple things. And so they've got to be doing more than just one thing. Co Coach Nancy, man, thanks. Let kids play more sports instead of specializing so early. I promise you, it will pay off later. It will pay off later. And that doesn't mean more sports all the time. Continue to build in breaks for them. All right. We have to give our children some breaks if we want them to be hungry in the time that matters uh, uh, the most. And so uh, our daughter made a varsity as a freshman, but ended up being the team cheerleader. Her position competes with the coaches that are in the same position. How do we encourage her to keep trying out? Oh man, I tell you that that's where, these are those situations that are, that are difficult, but here's what I would challenge you with, Angie, keep trying. All right, keep trying. Just keep going back. Position yourself for a place of honor. Hey, I'm going to do what's right. Many times, here's what athletes will say. Well, I'm going to work hard so that I can get playing time. Parents will say, 
well, we're, we want our kids to work hard so they can get playing time. Here's what I always challenge my kids with. Don't work hard to get playing time. Work hard because it's the right thing to do. And if you get playing time, it's an added bonus. I call it the law of re reciprocity. At some point, doing the right thing is going to show up in a positive way in your life. We want it to be that junior year you get the starting spot. Here's what I can tell you. 99% of the world won't remember that moment. Prepare them for the moments that are truly going to matter. Being a great father, being a great mother, being a great spouse, being a great friend, being a great neighbor, being a great servant. And so, listen, we have to keep the end game in mind when we're walking through these difficult uh, scenarios. But, hey, these things are real. They're out there. As a Better Way Athletics, we want to come alongside you again and help you. Make sure you follow us on social media. Uh, man, we, we would love to continue to communicate with you. We do work with athletes. We do, Michelle. So feel free to reach out. Send us an email. Again, my email is Heath, H-E-A-T-H, at a betterwayathletics.com. If you're a club director or a coach, here's what I want you to know. We will make this so affordable uh, to, to help engage your parents that you will not be able to, you will be crazy. I'm saying it. You, it's on camera. You will be crazy not to, to engage your parents and your coaches and help create alignment. You're going to benefit from it. And most importantly, the kids are going to benefit from it. And so, hey, to all of you that joined today, thanks so much for tuning in. It is a privilege. I want you to know, as a father myself, as a husband, it is a privilege for me to journey with you and partner with you. I don't have this figured out. Uh, if you see me out, introduce yourself. We want to get to know you and we want to help you as you navigate the sport journey and create a positive sport experience and help us restore the joy of sport for parents, coaches, and athletes. So we're going to be doing some more of these again, follow us on social media, check on social media, check out our website. We look forward to having continued impact in the sport world. Thank you guys so much.